When I first started on this journey as an entrepreneur, many people that heard about it went like this. What? Wow. So brave. So when I heard this the first time, it, it really I, I, I was really taken aback. I've been called many things in my life. Very careful, yes. Very stubborn, yes. Diabolical genius, <laughs> maybe. But brave? Almost never. So it got me thinking, what is so brave? about starting a company. Like you, uh, I studied hard in school, got a relatively prestigious scholarship, went off to study in a couple of good universities, did well, came back, served out my bond uh, in the civil service. And from there, decided that I needed to get to the business world and, and experience the golden age or the renaissance of technology. And after a while, it dawned on me that everyone who told me this was actually speaking code for this. Why give up so much? Give up in their minds, right? But during all of this past 14 years of uh, working, this is the number one lesson that I took away. VUCA is real. So what does VUCA stand for? Volatile, meaning things change constantly. You can never know when the next change is going to hit you. Uncertain. Not only are the outcomes unclear, or the payoffs unclear, the risks and the probabilities associated with those outcomes are also unclear. Complex, C. Even with huge amounts of processing power, it can be very difficult to do something as simple as predict the weather. And finally, ambiguous. If you are given a map of Singapore, but were told well, you didn't have that little pin that told you you are here, and at the same time, that map keeps morphing. That's what ambiguous is. And we live in a world where the economy is indeed VUCA. If you look at the S&P 500, this is a, a stock index of 500 of the world's largest companies. If you think about the Straits Times Index in Singapore and multiply that by 1,000, that gives you the S&P 500. Now, in the 1920s, Professor Richard Foster from Yale University found that the average lifespan of a company on this index was 67 years. So, for example, if you were Coca-Cola and you were on the S&P 500, and they still are today, thankfully, um, you could bet with good money that you will continue to remain on that index for the next 67 years. Today, any company on the S&P 500 chances are they'll be kicked out within 15 years. The pace of business, the pace of disruption has quadrupled in the last 100 years. And as a startup founder, uh, and my co-founder is sitting right behind me at the hall, we go through this and we experience this every day. When we started Engage Rocket, essentially we both took a step out of the corporate world where, you know, comfortable salaries, relatively nine to five jobs on weekends, you can switch off, go home, think about dogs and cats, to, to an environment where you have no salary. For the first year, we took zero money. Uh, we had no idea where the company was going to go. We had no idea what in the world was going to become of uh, what we were doing. And we, we, we felt this sense of Luca very keenly. So what Engage Rocket does is we help companies to build better workplaces using people analytics, essentially studying feedback from employees and workers in real time 
to be able to provide man management and leadership insights on how you can work better as teams, become more productive and more motivated. At that time, that was a crazy idea. Nobody even knew what in the world we were talking about. Now, thankfully, things have uh, two rounds of funding and, and a lot of traction later. In just the last two years, we've seen the company grow by 10 times. Um, we've now have a team across five countries, and, and, and we've, we've got the fortune of saying that we work together with uh, more than 30,000 users across Asia Pacific and uh, Australia. But at any point in time, this could have gone south. There's no guarantee at the beginning that we could have emerged, and even today, we can't say for sure that we emerged out of a critical environment. But if you ask me, would we do this again? I would say for sure, at least for me, it's a yes. And that's because of some of what I've learned that I'm going to share with you today. You can't just wing it as in the new economy. You have to be slow. Now these are just core competencies or core skills that you need to have in the new economy, no matter what it is that you decide to do with your life. The first of these is B. You need to have data fluency. What does this mean? In 2010, at the turn of this decade, the Harvard Business Review wrote about the next management revolution, in which they talked about big data at that time. And indeed, data is overwhelming us. Right now, this YouTube video is data, and it's going to be watched by hundreds, hopefully millions, across the world. The volume of data generation is astounding. Just in 2017 and 2018 alone, more data was created in the world than the previous 5,000 years of human history. Think about that. The speed at which data is flowing, the velocity of data. In just the time it takes for me to say this sentence, more data has passed through the entire internet than was stored on the whole World Wide Web just 10 years ago. And finally, the variety of data that's being collected. How many of you own, or how many of you don't own smartphones? How many of you know what your smartphones are? Telling all the application developers about it. You get all these apps, you download it, privacy statements, scroll, 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 agree. We have no idea what we're agreeing to. But all of this data is being collected. Similarly, uh, it's, what we, it's, it's what we do, we collect data for companies and share that. Uh, with leaders as well on how to manage people better, how to make better people decisions. So with all of this data flowing around the place, we can't afford to not be fluent in understanding data, in manipulating data, in asking the right questions of data. If we can't do that, I'd say that we are going to lag behind. The second major skill is operating flexibility. So this is just a fancy way of saying you need to adapt and be smart about adapting uh, to your situation. And the best way to adapt is really to s just stop guessing. A wise man once said that predictions are extremely difficult, especially when they're about the future. And that's no more true than today. If you look at all the primary school students in Singapore today, 65% of them are going to be in jobs that don't even exist today. When I think back about my time when I was in your shoes, thinking about my career ahead, all I wanted to do was to work extremely hard, make sure I got a damn good government scholarship, come back, serve out that bond, and, and become, you know, I don't know, the next CEO of SMRP. Or the alternative path was work really hard, go to a good university, become a consultant, management consultant, or an investment banker. That was, those were the main options on the table when I was in your shoes. And indeed, to a certain extent, uh, ran some of that path out. Went to a good school, and surprisingly, by the age of 29, I, was, I, I found myself looking at my career and going, okay, what next? And 
At the time that I did the scholarship, there was no way that I would have guessed that 15 years, 20 years down the line, I would be running a technology startup and trying to build the startup ecosystem here in Singapore together with my fellow entrepreneurs. And it's the same for all of us. Every generation, uh, there's, there's this thing where we try to predict what are going to be the next hot jobs of the future. But today, the data scientists of the world and the digital marketers of the world, just 10 years ago, these jobs did not exist. There are so many of them out there today, and there are so many different specializations that you can go into. So really, stop guessing. Be flexible and take things as they come and have a guiding light at the end of it to spur you on. The next uh, skill that you need to have uh, would be obviously around people. Now, this will never go away if you think about it. One of the biggest questions I get when uh, working with partners and customers is how do I prevent my job from disappearing to a robot? How do I prevent myself from being disrupted? And the answer is really to play to our strengths as, as human beings. I'll give you a good example. Today, machines already beat us at all kinds of tasks. They beat us in board games, like chess and Ritchie. Really they beat us at video games. And they even beat us at image recognition, something which you would assume is a fundamentally human thing. They also beat lawyers at being able to research and prepare legal documents by factors of multitudes. They are more than 100 times faster, for example, in preparing divorce documentation. But would you trust a machine to go to the client and walk through that sensitive discussion with the husband and wife? Machines can already almost do surgery automatically. But even if they go through all that surgery using technology, would you trust a robot to explain to the family of the deceased why their loved one has passed away? And what happened in the operating theatre? There are certain things that are still fundamentally human, which we need to be good at. Working in teams, developers, it's a common myth that developers sit around at the desk all day by themselves, coding, writing different lines of code. When the reality is, more than half of their jobs are working with other developers on the team to figure out what is this domain model look like, what kind of code should we write, what are the trade-offs that we're going to be making. We can't run away from being human, so we might as well be damn good at it. The last skill which I have found to be particularly useful is uh, entrepreneurial chops. So what exactly do we mean by entrepreneurial chops? It really just means growing a thick skin. So when my co-founder and I started at Gate Rocket, we had just this tiny kernel of an idea, and we were trying to do a thousand and one things at once. Not least, number one, trying to sell to customers before a single line of code was written, before we even had any mock-ups of anything. Trying to get customers to part with their money and agree to let us work with them so that we can get our traction and get started and validate that idea. We had to convince extremely talented people to join this company of ours, which to all intents and purposes was a figment of our imagination. They were very smart, had a thousand and one other offers and a thousand and one other things to do. Why would they join us? What gave us the right to ask for them to join our team? And finally, when it came to asking for money, going to investors who have hundreds and thousands of other entrepreneurs, pitching them daily to part with their money and to invest it in us, to convince them that we are going to generate a better return for, for you, Mr. Investor, or Miss Investor. The only way you can do that is to believe very strongly and to have extremely thick skin. And even after all of that, there's no guarantee that you're going to succeed. So you have to believe, regardless of the outcome, that what you're doing is the right thing. And this applies to whether or not you're going to entrepreneurship or whether you're uh, working in a large company somewhere. You need to fight for what you believe in 
and to have the conviction to take it through. So by all means, study hard. Please do. Work hard, build your resumes, and for goodness sakes, graduate. But at the end of it, if you forget to be dope, you just might be making the riskiest career decision of your life. Thank you.